Next up, we have our final presentation of the scaling and performance session titled, I believe it's pronounced Cowrie, Scalable BFT Consensus with Pipelined Tree-Based Dissemination and Aggregation by Ray Neheiser. My name is Ray Neheiser. So it's a slightly different pronunciation, but um, even people in my own country get it wrong, so it's not so bad. <laughs> I'm going to present you our joint work, Kauri Scalable BFT Consensus with Pipeline Tree-Based Dissemination and Aggregation, which was one of these SOSP papers. As in many of the tags today, there is a lot of interest for permission blockchains, and there is also a decent interest for a large number of consensus participants. And there's just like relatively famous example, our DM that stated that in their white paper, or also Corda. Now, most of these systems rely on BFT consensus and most commonly on some kind of PBV derivative or, or hot stuff. PBFT works relatively straightforward where there's a leader that sends the message, a proposal to everyone. Everyone then votes on that. That goes for several phases. And then there's a, an agreement on a given value or a set of values. Now, if the leader fails, uh, the leaders just switch to a different process. And after F plus one steps, there obviously is going to be a correct leader and the system will be able to achieve consensus. And as such, PBFT is a good example or the derivatives are a good example because they offer high resilience, low latency and optimal reconfiguration as such in F plus one steps, they will be able to reconfigure correctly. One of the problems of PBFT, PBFT derivatives are that they have a high message complexity due to the quadratic message complexity. Um, hot stuff is one of the approaches that tries to solve that a little bit. So instead of having all the members broadcast the messages, the, there's a center process that disseminates and aggregates the messages. So it has twice the number of communication steps per phase. And relatively similar to BBFD, if the leader fails, the leader's just switched. And again, after F plus one steps, we have a correctly robust system and consensus can be achieved. It has the same high resilience, is able to drop a little bit of the message complexity and still achieve optimal reconfiguration. But like it said, it now has twice the latency actually. And one of the problems of these solutions is that they're actually inherently non-scalable. And it's because one or more processes have to send, receive and process all N messages. And that leads basically to a bottleneck in terms of both bandwidth and CPU. And there are a bunch of alternatives in the literature that try to solve that. And that are on the, on the basis of these algorithms, either committee-based solutions or solutions that are based on dissemination and aggregation trees. Um, committee-based solutions are relatively straightforward where instead of having all the processes agree on the value we each round, select a subset of processes and that subset of process will do it in the name of the others and then propagate the result. The problem is that there's still a decent chance that uh, in one of these rounds, a majority of incorrect processes are there. So that can cause certain problems like in some cases, low resilience or uh, in many cases also cause non-deterministic safety. Tree-based solutions avoid this and such that they're similar to hot stuff where they create just a different communication architecture where certain processes will relay the messages. And that way we are able to dispute both the communication load and the processing load while maintaining the same resilience as PBFD and hot stuff and the overall same guarantees. The problem is that these approaches are relatively hard to configure. And on top of that, they have a problem of high latency. Like hot stuff already has twice the number of communication steps per phase. Now a tree has based on the dev four, six, eight, ten times more, and which leads to problems in terms of throughput as well. And in terms of reconfiguration, just doing the same approach of trying a different leader won't do it because depending on the number of internal nodes and how the faults are distributed in the system, we might never find a correct tree this way. And actually there's even a factorial number of different trees where only a small percentage is correct. So it's a really hard problem to solve. And in terms of the latency, while the messages propagate through the system, the majority of the time, the majority of the processes are just idle waiting for the next message or waiting for the answers to process which basically is a big problem because 
the actual resource utilization is very low, so the throughput is much lower than it actually could be. And that's actually what we tried to solve with Cowery, because Cowery is a tree-based approach, so we also use dissemination and aggregation trees, but we tried to solve several of those uh, problems. So we address the following main challenges, where we have optimal reconfiguration for low F, or number of failures, we compensate the extra latency through a pipe lighting scheme, and we still offer high resilience. Let's first check out how we do the reconfiguration. Now, let's assume we have a generic tree, like here with a fan out of five. And as long as our number of failures is smaller than the fan out, I will show you how we will be able to reconfigure a tree such that we construct a robust tree in optimal steps. So as we have the fan out here, we have to construct more bins than we have failures. So each bin contains then the number of internal nodes. So then in this case, we have six internal nodes. So we build F plus one bins of six or more nodes. And then relatively straightforward, if we then replace each bin, each number, each internal nodes with a bin, eventually we will pick the bin without any faulty nodes, which has to be there since there are more bins than faulty nodes. And we'll be able to build a robust tree in optimal steps. In terms of latency, we do a similar approach as Hot Stuff does for their problems, but we extend it further. So as the leader sends the first message out, the leader already knows the uh, hash of the previous block. So the leader can also construct the second block and the third block, and in the meanwhile, pipeline several blocks optimistically through the system. The problem is how many messages can we actually pipeline? And so we have to look into how to how we configure this actually, because if we choose two small values, we will underutilize the resources and have a lower throughput than necessary. And if we have two large values, that will lead to congestion and the latency for the client will be much higher than necessary. So we need a performance model to configure Kauri properly. So there's basically a total time that each round takes, and the time is more or less dominated by the hop latency, so the time the propagation takes, and the computation at each step. And of the total time, there's a small time we call the idle time. So it's basically the total time minus the time the process at the root need, takes to send the messages, and then minus the time it needs to process the messages. And when then if we have the total time, uh, the idle time, and the process time, we can then calculate the pipelining stretch, which is the number of additional blocks we're going to process in the system. And if you want to hear more of these details, we have them in the paper that's going to be published in SSP. And if you want to have it beforehand, you can send me a, a message on Slack and I can give you a preprint. And we evaluated this on Grid 5000 with up to 20 physical machines and did a, executed a number of different experiments. So I'll quickly describe a small subset, which are the most significant ones. So this particular experiment was executed with three different sizes of validator sets, namely 100, 200, and 400 in a setting of 100 millisecond round trip time and 100 MB links. So that's, for example, an inner Europe or inner US setting. And Kauri is presented with the two blue lines, one and one with and one without pipelining, and hot stuff presented in the orange and red uh, line with the yeah, and uh, we configured the pipelining stretch of Cori according to the previously presented theoretical model, resulting in a stretch between four and six. And so we can see on the x-axis the, the throughput and uh, on the number of processes and the y the throughput. And we can already see that there's a pretty big difference between uh, Cori and the star-based approach, where Cori actually has a throughput advantage of up to 26 times the throughput of hot stuff. And that is even that is due to these inherent scalability issues that I mentioned earlier with the large uh, validator sets. And that also shows that the non-pipeline version of Kauri above 200 processes already performs better than hot stuff. And at 400 um, already has doubled the performance, even though the high latency should be a relatively large problem. In the second experiment, we did a different setup where we had 200 milliseconds round trip latency and 25 megabyte links. 
which is a setting, which is a geographic blockchain setting, which can also be found like in the Algorand paper, for example. And for this uh, experiment, we varied the block size between 32K and 1 MB, and then check the maximum throughput we can achieve. So we have on the X axis, the throughput, and the Y axis, the latency for this. Now, hot stuff is relatively straightforward, but basically when we increase the block size, the latency also increased because the system starts bottlenecking and the throughput increases as well until it reaches the maximum the system is able to handle. Now, in car readers results are a little, a little bit different. So first of all, if we have very large block sizes, um, the performance, we can't pipeline as well because we can not just pipeline 0.1 blocks. So that's why we have at the top part of the graph, a little reduction in throughput. Similarly, because we only had 20 available um, server physical machines at very low block sizes, we are computing so many blocks in the system, such that it was up to 25 concurrent blocks, that the performance degraded a little bit and we had actually a lower throughput than we actually could and a slightly higher latency because of the congestion. However, the key takeaway of this graph is that there is a the increase of latency is actually much higher than the increase um, increase of latency is much higher in hot stuff than the increase of latency in the calorie. So that in certain scenarios, even though we have the tree with the twice the number of communications type in this example, calorie still performs better than hot stuff in terms of latency in a number of the scenarios. Finally, we did a small test where we evaluate the impact of failures on the system. So we measured this in the same setting as the previous experiment with 200 millisecond round trip latency and 25 megabit links and configured the system in a way such that the current leader fails after 40 seconds and consecutively after being elected, the next two leaders fail in the same manner. And at this contributed low number of failures, we see that Cori not only configures in a small time period as hot stuff, but it's also able to rescale up the pipelining uh, to attain a similar throughput value as before. So concluding, Cori is able to easily scale to hundreds of processes in comparison to the state of the art. We outperform previous work by a factor of up to 28 in one of the scenarios. We have no resilience trade-offs and achieve optimal reconfiguration for a small value of f, which is um, arguably the most common case. There's much more experiments in the actual paper. And we also have a new prototype available on GitHub if anyone is interested. Uh, thanks everyone for listening and I'll be happy to answer any questions.